DJs. Welcome to my advanced mapping techniques tutorial. If you don't know anything about mapping controllers and tracker, I recommend watching my basic mapping video first. And since this is kind of a long video, I've made a table of contents for this video so you can jump directly to whichever part interests you. We're going to start by mapping a very simple function, just a play pause button for deck B over here. So let's go ahead and add an input deck common, play pause, learn, we're going to click a button here. There are three different types of interaction modes for a button. You have toggle, hold, and direct. I'm going to define these a little bit more specifically for mapping purposes. Toggle means when you hit the button, it changes the function to the opposite of what it was. So here we have a play pause toggle for deck B. Right now deck B is not playing. We hit it, it's playing hit the button again, it's not playing. So when you press the button down, it activates the function. Next, we have hold. Hold means when you press the button, it activates the function. When you release the button, it turns it back off. We need to make the distinction between the down action and the up action of the button here. And direct simply changes the value to a preset number. Let's go ahead and change that to one. When we press that play button, it turns the play pause on for deck B, press it again, it always just directs it to that one value. Now notice the little invert button here, this is interesting. Let's duplicate this, let's make another one, and then on invert, we're going to change it back to a zero. Now observe what happens here. Press the button, play pause is on, let go, turns it off. So here, this is an equivalent function to hold. When you press the button down, it toggles the play mode on, and then that invert, the release action, directs it to zero right here. So it's exactly the same as hold. Let me give you another example. I'm going to show you an effects lock on feature using a modifier. This is kind of interesting. Add in. I'm going to do button one on effects unit two over here, we're going to go ahead and just assign it to one of the pads. And then that's going to be a hold, so that means when we hold this pad, that effect is on, when we release it, it's off. We're going to add a modifier, modifier one. We're also going to have, let's just go ahead and use this button here for it, and this is going to also have a hold. I'm going to hold that value to 1. Okay, great. So when we press this button, if you look up here in this section of the screen, we're going to have a value of 1. When you release it, it's going to change it back to 0. Good. Now let's go back to this effects button, and we're going to add in a modifier condition. And we're going to say that if modifier 1 is equal to 0, the hold action works. If it's, and if it's any number other than 0, it does not work. So look at what happens. Right now the effects work, now they're off. If we hold the modifier, now this condition is not met. M1 is not equal to zero, so our effect does not work. All right, now check this out. We turn the effect on, hold the modifier, and then release the effect button, and observe what happened. We just canceled that off action, and it's still on, it's locked in. So this is how you can use the effects on and a modifier to lock it in place because we know that the hold action consists of a down action and an up action when you release the button. Okay, let me show you another use for modifiers here. This is one's pretty interesting here. Let's go ahead and map a modifier one. And we're gonna have it so it toggles, but we're gonna use the modifier as a condition for itself. So take a look at this. We're going to have modifier one as a condition as well. If modifier one is equal to zero, we're going to change the value to one. And then we're going to duplicate that. And then if it's one, we're going to change it back to zero. So it's just going to flip-flop between one and zero. Now we're going to add that condition to another function. Effects unit one on for deck A, and what we're going to do here is we're going to base it off that condition. If it's zero, then we're going to 
turn that effects unit on. Go ahead and copy that. And then if it's one, we're gonna turn that effects unit off. And let's go ahead and add another one. And we're gonna add effects unit two for deck A. And also this is gonna have the same modifier conditions. If modifier one is equal to zero, we're gonna turn that on, duplicate. And then if it's equal to one, we're gonna turn it off. Now what we're doing is we're lining up the effects unit one and effects unit two on functions with the modifier. And essentially since the functions are based on the value of a modifier, it links them together. So take a look at this. We click this button, we get effects unit one and two come on for deck A. Click again, they both turn off. Now here's where the magic part is. Say you used another controller or maybe you clicked with your mouse and they become not synchronized with each other. Now if there were toggles, what would happen when you click the button is essentially they would just flip flop and you'd get this or you'd get that. But check this out. They always link back up together. And that's kind of the magic of this little trick with the modifier. And if you didn't quite catch that, it's in the PDF. Here I'm going to demonstrate using multiple modifiers for a condition for a play pause button. This is kind of an interesting, it's a combination of a play pause and a button that turns off a loop. So just follow, follow along with me here. Okay, we're going to map a play pause for deck B so we can kind of see that over here. Okay. And what we're going to do here is if deck B is not playing, we're going to turn the play pause on. There we go. And then here comes the interesting part. If it is playing, and if deck B is not in loop, so loop active off, play pause on, we're going to take it out of play mode, so we're going to stop the deck. All right. Now we're going to add another function here. So if the deck is playing, deck B is play pause is on, and it's in loop, is an active loop. So if the deck B is playing and it's in loop, this play pause button, instead of stopping the deck, will take it out of the loop. It's the next thing I'd like to do, uh, we've got this all set up, but I'd also like to map an LED output here. So let's go ahead and map a play pause output here. So play pause out, let's go ahead and set it to this button. And I'm gonna use a modifier condition. I'm gonna say that the play pause will only be used if that deck is not in loop. So deck B is not in loop. And then if play pause is zero, we're gonna send a zero. If it's one, meaning it is playing, we send a 127, it's gonna turn that light on and assign it to deck B. And then the only other condition we have now, so we're covered for when it's not in loop, but when it is in loop, I'd also, I'd like to have a different type of output. So what I'd like to, the button to do is, if it's off, it's not playing, the light's off. If it's playing, the light is solid. And then if you're in loop, I want a different indicator. So we can make this flash using a beat phase output. Let's check that out. Go ahead and learn. And then the beat phase, it goes from negative 0.5 up to positive 0.5. This is the entire beat phase range zero being the time when the kick drum hits, the zero phase mark, that's that little mark that's indicated by your grid marker and all those little tick marks in the track. So I like to flash the light pretty much right on B. So let's go ahead, just say zero to point 0.1. And then that's saying when you're within that range, we're gonna send a 127, we're gonna turn this blend off and then sign that to deck B. And then what we're gonna do is if we are an active loop here, 
then that is the output we're going to get. Let's test it out. Right now, deck B is not playing. You hear we hit play. Here we stop the deck. Great, we have that light output. Now let's put it into a loop. Boom, there we go. We've got a loop going on. The light is flashing. And because we're in loop, this is no longer a play pause button. Watch this. There, took it out of loop. And now it's a play pause button. Hit it again. It stops the deck. Very cool trick. Okay, the next thing I'd like to do here is map some buttons for loop in and out points to make it behave a lot like a CDJ. What I'm going to do here is have a loop in, a loop out button, and a button that turns the loop off. And then when we're in loop, we're going to be able to adjust the length of the loop with these two buttons. So we're going to use some modifier conditions for that. And let's get started. Okay, we're going to add loop in, set Q, learn, and we're just going to do this for deck B here. And the condition is going to be if the deck is not already in loop. So if it's not in loop, we're going to trigger that loop in point for deck B. Then we're going to add another command here. Loop out, learn, this pad here. And that will also be if the deck is not already in loop. Okay, great. So here we go, let's we'll just take a look. Hit play on this deck, loop in, loop out, now we have a loop, great. Okay. Next thing I wanna do is add the loop length adjust here. Loop size selector, learn. And what we're gonna say here is if that deck is already in loop, so that's a one here button and we're going to Decrease that value and we're just going to take it down one loop size. And then let's make another one for the other pad here. It's in loop and we're going to increase the loop length here. And let's go ahead and add that button that turned the loop off. And we're going to go ahead and just do this pad here. Okay. And let's actually add some outputs to make it just a little bit easier to see what's going on here. And what I'd like to do is, let's make these buttons flash if we're in a loop. So let's go ahead and do a beat phase indicator. There we go. And we're just gonna center it right pretty much at the zero phase mark there. So zero to point 0.1. And what we're going to do here is put a condition so if it's in loop, we're going to put that beat phase output, and we're going to have the same beat phase output on the second pad. Now the next thing we want to do is, if it's not in loop, we want to turn those pads off. So let's check that out. So I'm going to duplicate that. And here what I'm going to do is if it's not in loop, then we're going to actually have the entire range here. So negative 0.5 to positive 0.5, that's the entire beat phase range. And we're going to invert that. So no matter what beat phase we're in, if it's not in loop, it's going to turn the LED off. So that's kind of the explanation of that. All right, and do it for the same for the other pad there. And another thing I want to do also is if it's in loop, I'd also like for it to also be playing to turn that on. There we go. Okay, and now let's check that out. Okay, so right now we're not playing and we're not in loop. So you hit the play button, loop in, loop out. Now that we're in a loop, we get the flashing beat phase indicator. We can go down loop sizes here, and then we can go up loop sizes here, and then we have the loop out, which turns it off and in turn also turns the lights off. So in, out, loop size, off. In this next example, I will show you how to use modifiers 
to attach functions such as loops to make to decks to make them behave like effects. In the example of my machine fusion mapping and a lot of the other machine effects mappings I've made, you have a deck select button here that selects the effects that this column of buttons works on, but it also works with loops. So how do you make that work? Loops are specific to each deck and they don't really behave like effects units. So let me show you how that's done. Here, we're gonna add four modifiers and they're gonna be latching modifiers. Basically, they're gonna either have a zero or a one and they will attach a deck to the loop function. So uh, I'm gonna use modifier one, two, three, and four for deck A, B, C, and D. And here I'm gonna have them so they just toggle. So each modifier is gonna be dependent on its own conditions here. So if modifier one is equal to zero, it's gonna change to a one. And then if it's equal to a one, it'll flip back to zero. So here I have the modifiers that have the flip-flop values, so they either go between 0 and 1. So let's just take a look at that. So 1 can flip-flop between 1 and 0. You got 2, 3, and 4. So I'm going to map the appropriate outputs here. And here I'm using the controller range. This is kind of a, my way of doing it. I think this is kind of a more technically correct way. If the controller range is in this range, which is one or one, so if it's one, we send a one. If it's not within the range, so if it's zero or two or three or any other number, we send a zero. So that's how we're gonna do that. Okay, and now we have the buttons with the corresponding lights so we know if those modifiers have a value of one, those lights will all be lit up. Whichever de deck is latched on here will have the loop control function attached to it. So what I'm gonna do is assign this button to trigger a 32 bar auto loop on every deck that is selected here. Map a loop size select plus set for this button right here, and we're going to have a modifier condition if modifier 1 is equal to 1, and we're going to direct this to a 1 32nd bar loop for deck A. Now observe what happens here. We're going to just go ahead and duplicate that, and now if modifier 2 is equal to 1, then it will do the same thing for deck B. Add another one for deck C. and one for deck D. And take a look at what happens here. If we hit the button, nothing happens. If we have deck A selected, we can trigger a 30 second bar loop on deck A. If we have B selected, it also does it for B. You have all of them selected, you get all four decks. So here I'm demonstrating how you can use modifiers to latch certain functions together. As you get into more complex mappings, you may find out that you're running out of modifiers. And in my last example, we used four of them just to latch functions to the decks. And we only used the values zero and one for each modifier, which is not a very efficient use of these modifiers. There is a way to kind of compress the use of these modifiers by using more values and using fewer modifiers. It's a little confusing, so I'd recommend following along in the guide and you can also just write this out in a notebook. So what I'd like to do is instead of using four modifiers to latch these functions, I'm gonna use just two, but I'm gonna use more values. So this is gonna be set up kind of like a little binary system. In the example, I will use modifier seven to control the latching for deck A and B, and modifier eight for the latching on deck C and D. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna assign different values, and we're gonna say that 
the value of 0 is going to be a is off and b is off. The value of 1 is going to be a is on and b is off. The value of 2 is going to be a off, b on. The value of 3 is going to be a and b on. And likewise with modifier 8, this is going to be c and d off. Going to be c on, d off is going to be a value of 1. c off, d on is going to be a value of 2. And then the value of 3 will get us both c and d. Before we map it in, it's nice to write down what the values will change to. When we're toggling A, if we have a 0, we want to change it to a 1. If we have a 1, we want to change it to a 0. 2 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 2. With that little list there, it makes it quite a bit easier just to map it in. OK, that's one button. Next, it's still going to be a modifier 7. 0, now we're going to go to a value of 2, 1 gets us a 3, now let's just duplicate the process for modifier 8, next button, okay so these are good. Let's go ahead and map the outputs. So we need to keep in mind when those decks will be on. So we need to also make another chart. Looks like we want the light on for when modifier 7 is equal to 1 and 3. That is meaning that deck A is latched to it for the first button. And then the 2 and 3 functions go for the B. And then 1 and 3 and 2 and 3. So um, if you don't make a chart first, probably going to mess it up. So definitely uh, follow along with this. I'm going to map the off function here. Duplicate, learn. One turns it on. Two turns it off. Three turns it on. As you can see, this gets a little tedious. For the values two and three, since the numbers are grouped together, we can actually save quite a bit of time with this. Now, take a look at this. We don't need to have a modifier condition here. We just need to say that if the value is between 2 and 3, we turn it on. Otherwise, it's off. And that is the magic of having numbers that are grouped together. Because we know that outside of that range, the light's off. Within that range, it's on. Unfortunately, the 1 and the 3 are broken up, and that's why we had to map them separately. And again, for modifier 8, here we have to break it up, unfortunately. 0 gets us an off. One gets us an on. Two is off. Three is on. The next button. Numbers are grouped together, so we don't need that special modifier. We just say from two to three it's on, otherwise it's off because it doesn't fall within that range. And let's take a look what we have here. Keep in mind the modifier numbers up here, seven and eight up here on the screen. And they all turn on, they all turn off. 
here we have a value of one. We hit both of them, we get we have three. If it's just deck B, then we have a two. If it's none of them, it's a zero. Let's check the second set, get a zero. A only is a one. B only is a two. And both of them are three. Now let's go ahead and link that back to that loop control function. Okay, so we're gonna map the loop size select plus set. And here we're gonna use the modifiers that we had from our chart. The one and three links it to A. Two and three links it to B. One and three for modifier eight links it to C. And two and three links it to D. So let me show you how that's done. Let's just go through the motions, follow along with me here. So deck A. Modifier 7 with a value of 1. And we're also accepting a value of 3 for that. Two is for deck B. And three will also trigger deck B. And then we're going to map deck C gets a value of 1 and 3, but for modifier 8, duplicate that, we get that, that 3 value as well. Duplicate. Deck D takes the values of 2 and 3 from modifier 8. So the, this mapping is a little bit longer. There's more conditions for the modifiers. Um, there are actually twice as many commands for the loop size select plus set, but we have two modifiers instead of four. And if you're running out of modifiers and you have to do this, this is a lifesaver. All right, and here I'm gonna demonstrate that this does in fact do exactly the same thing as what we had before with the four modifiers. So here we have the loop size select. Okay, nothing's happening. Got deck A on, let's do deck B. Okay, we've got both of them. We have three decks and we have all four. So as you can see, it's an equivalent mapping. It just uses two modifiers instead of four of them. In this example, I will use two modifiers to assign a function to an encoder and then route it to a deck. I'm gonna use the tractor control F1 in this example. Um, in the supplied PDF manual, the example is with a Mark II machine. I don't have one of those, so we're just gonna use this here. And what I'd like to do is assign the encoder to be deck volume or deck gain. And then we're gonna route it to deck A, B, C, or D using these buttons here. So first of all, let's use modifier one for the mode. And then we're going to use modifier 2 to route it to the decks. So here we have our two systems of modifiers. This gives a value of 0 to modifier 1, and here we have a value of 1. And then modifier 2 is 0, 1, 2, or 3. Now let's go ahead and map this encoder. Modifier 1 is going to be the encoder mode, 0 is going to give us a volume, and then modifier 2 will be the deck routing, so 0 is going to get us to deck A. The value of 1 will route it to deck B, 2 routes it to C. and three routes it to D. All right, now let's map the deck gain adjust. Modifier one is the mode modifier, so we're gonna give that a value of one. Modifier two is the routing. Zero routes it to deck A. Let's take a 
what? Let's switch the mode to volume for deck A. Deck B, C, D. Game mode, deck A, B, C, D. And let's just add another little feature just for fun. We're going to use the down press of the encoder. Modifier 1 equals 0, that's volume mode. Let's add another reset here for the gain. All right, let's check it out. Let's go back to volume mode, deck A. Adjust the volume, reset. Adjust the volume, reset. Adjust the volume, reset. Volume, reset. Gain mode, gain, reset. Gain. So very cool, that's how you use a system of modifiers. The first one is the mode, the second one is the routing. In this example, I will show you how to map a sequential effects trigger. This is like the secret combination effects introduced by Ian Golden for the MIDI fighter. Essentially, if you trigger the buttons in a certain order, you get another effect that comes on. What we're, we're gonna do here is map the four beat master speeds, and then if you hit them sequentially, one, two, three, then four. The last pad will also trigger a transpose stretch effect. So this is how you do it. First, we're gonna start with the modifier. Modifier one. And if that modifier has a value of zero, we're gonna increase it. On the second pad, we'll increase the value only if it has a value of one. That means we'd hit the first button all previously. And then here, if it's already equal to 2, we're going to go ahead and increase that value. So this kind of counts up. If we have a 0, then this one will increase the value. If we already have a 1, that means we've already hit these two buttons and it increases the value again. Now we need to have a function that resets them back to 0 if you hit them in the wrong order. And here, each button will reset the modifier back to zero when you release it. So this ensures that you must hit all the buttons in sequence to reach the proper value. So just take a look at this upper modifier section of the screen. So right now, if you hit any of the buttons, only the first one makes a change in the modifier. However, if you hit them sequentially, one, then two, and third pad, and then the fourth one, you get increasing values of that modifier. Next, let's go ahead and map the button that turns the beat masher effect on. And we're going to map in the beat masher speeds. Alright, and now when we hit the pads, we've got the different speeds for the beat masher. Now let's bring in that transpose stretch effect. What I'd like to do is set up the initial value for the transpose stretch before we get to the last pad. So when we're triggering this sequence, I'd like to have the transpose stretch set up when we hit this pad, so it'll be ready by the time we hit the last pad. So let's take a look at the modifier values up here. We have one, two, and then three here. So when we have a value of two, the modifiers are evaluated before you hit the pad. So here we have one and now we have two. So the moment we hit this pad, before we hit it, it evaluates the modifier. So right now modifier one is equal to two. Then once we hit the pad, it'll change to three. So here's what we're gonna do.
if modifier 1 has a value of 2, that means we followed the sequence, we're going to direct that transpose stretch value to 0 0.8. Okay? And then next what we're going to do is we're going to have a button that turns that effect on. And that's the last pad. So if we followed the sequence before we hit the pad, the modifier 1 will have a value of 3. And then I'm also adding an off function on invert that turns that button off. Hold already says that it will turn that button off. However, it has a modifier condition in it. So if we release one of the other buttons first, that condition is no longer met, and you could actually accidentally lock that transpose stretch in. That's why we have the redundant off command right here, where on invert turns it off no matter what. Next, I'd also like to have the transpose stretch go down. So we're going to map in the changing parameter for the transpose stretch effect here. This also has the same modifier condition, m1 is equal to 3. Button, decrease, and it's going to say auto repeat. And let's take a look here. And there we have it. If we follow the sequence, the transpose stretch is triggered. If we do not, we can use the beat masher independently. And the transpose stretch is triggered only if you follow the sequence. One, two, three, then four. I'm going to drop a beat. We probably want to have some feedback with these buttons. I'd like them to light up when I hit them. So let's map that. I'm going to map a button 1 output for effects unit 2. And we're going to map it so if it's on, it turns the light on. Okay, and now whenever we trigger the beat masher, we get a light output. Now how do we get these to light up separately? Let's try that instead. Let's add a knob 1 output for effects unit 2. And then we're going to use this controller range here. And we know that the knob 1 input for this pad sets it to the value of 0.5. So what I'd like to do here is we're going to match that up here. If it happens to be 0.5, we send an output. Next, this one has a value of 0.75. The third pad is 0.9. And the last one has a value of 1. And now when we hit the pads, it will light up for the correct value. In this particular example, we actually don't need to map the light output for the pads. There's an easier way, so let's actually delete these real quick. Change these for LED for MIDI out. And this just means whenever you hit the pad, the light comes on. Much simpler way of doing it. And there you have it. Let's use the beat phase indicator to make the lights chase each other. We're going to start at zero phase mark here, and the lights will chase each other moving upward. Take a look at the PDF manual. I have some values already set up. I broke the beat phase range into eight separate pieces because we have eight buttons here. I wrote down the values from the guide into a notebook, and let's map them in.
Remember to also map the off command. And now when the deck is playing, we get a beat phase indicator. And when the deck is stopped, the lights turn off. The Mark II machine also has a multicolor output for the pads. It's called HSB color mode. Um, I don't have a Mark II, so I can't actually demonstrate, but I'll still cover a little bit of the information here. Essentially, HSB means hue, saturation, and brightness. To use this feature, you need to output numbers on three different channels to achieve a color output on the machine. Let's start out in Native Instruments Controller Editor. Here we have the Mark II machine, and notice we have different types of color modes here. There's a single, dual, and HSB. Single mode is pretty straightforward. Either the light is off or it's on and then you pick the color. Dual color mode allows you to pick the off color and the on color. And the HSB means that you have to send the hue, saturation, and brightness information from Tractor for that light to come on. The first thing we'll need to do is set all the pads that are in HSB mode to channel one. So here we have these on channel one. The control change number doesn't matter, but they must be on channel one. In Tractor, say we do a hotkey type output. And we can pick any hotkey type. This number that you enter right here will determine the color that is sent to the controller. A 40 turns out to be a green color. And here's where it gets interesting. You can't just hit learn. You have to actually send a command on that same control change number, but on channel 2. And then we send the saturation. 127 is the maximum saturation. If we were to send a smaller number, like a 1, we would end up with almost no color or a white LED. Next is the brightness. This one is sent on channel three, the same control change number. And this is our brightness. And the smaller number is the lowest brightness, so very dim, and 127 will get us full brightness on that. You should place the send monitor state command strategically throughout your mapping with commands that make large changes to parameters in the mapping, such as active deck select buttons, effect select buttons, and modifiers. The send monitor state command is located under the global section. And in this particular mapping, we have active deck select buttons, a main modifier, and deck loading buttons. Those commands are linked to loading different decks, loading different hot cues, different effect settings, and it's a good idea to send a monitor state to update LED information in combination with those commands. To map the machine knobs, let's start in controller editor. Take a look, there are a couple different modes for the knobs. Notice we have an absolute and a relative mode. Absolute means that it is a knob. If you turn the knob to the left, the value will decrease until it reaches zero. If you turn it to the right, it will increase until it reaches 127. If you continue to turn it to the right, the value will still send a 127. Notice there's also a resolution here. 360 means one complete revolution, or 360 degrees, is what it takes to get from zero up to 127. Let's go ahead and map something. Volume adjust for deck A. And we're going to set this as a fader or a knob in direct mode. And let's take a look here. We've got our volume adjust. Looks like it works great. Well, let me show you a side effect of this knob here. If we drag the volume down using a different control like the mouse, the last value that the controller sent was a 127. So if we turn it to the left, it's going to send a number slightly smaller than 127. And look, the knob jumps to that value. That's definitely not desirable while you're playing a set. So there is something else we can do here. 
you click the mapping and click Soft Takeover, let's observe what happens here. Turn it all the way up, drag it down with the mouse, and we turn the knob, it doesn't jump, but it doesn't do anything at all until that knob sends a zero, and then it links back up. So that's pretty good, but I think we can do better than that. Let's turn that off, and what we're going to do here is send an output back to the controller, and we're going to send the current value of that volume of deck A back to the controller to update it with the information for the knob. This is kind of cool. So here we are, we're going to turn the volume all the way up. We're going to drag it down to zero with the mouse. Now when we did that, Tractor sent a zero to the controller and updated the information. Now the knob knows that it should be at zero. And notice, it does not jump. Let's go ahead and try that with another control. So we're mapping the filter for deck A. And notice, here we are, we got a filter, works great. And now we're going to add an output. And observe what happens here. As we turn the filter, if we turn the knob slowly, it seems to get stuck in the middle. Some controls in Tractor do not like it when you send an output back to the knob. 